Hi everyone and welcome back to Medibrain. Today's topic is Waterhouse Friedrichsen Syndrome, so let's dive in. Back in the early 1900s, Rupert Waterhouse and Carl Friedrichsen were the physicians who gave the disease its <laughs> name, called Waterhouse Friedrichsen Syndrome. It's defined as an acute primary insufficiency of the adrenal gland, most commonly caused by adrenal hemorrhage due to severe bacterial infection, and is seen in small children, asplenic or immunosuppressed individuals, so every age is possible. There are three main groups of vessels that supply the adrenal gland with blood starting from the abdominal aorta. The superior suprarenal arteries, derived from the inferior phrenic arteries, the middle suprarenal artery, derived from the aorta, and the inferior suprarenal arteries derived from the renal artery. All these arteries drain into the medullary vein, which is not shown here, and from there into the suprarenal vein. The left one returns the blood via the renal vein into the inferior vena cava, while the right one drains straight into the inferior vena cava. Waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome is a dangerous complication of a number of diseases but most commonly associated with meningococcal meningitis causing sepsis. Other pathogens could be Haemophilus influenzae, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and others. Rarer causes include disseminated intravascular coagulation or endotoxic shock. Whatever the reason, if bacteria cause an infection leading to septicemia, these bacteria release endotoxins, also called lipopolysaccharide molecules, which damage endothelial cells of blood vessels. The result is the release of procoagulant tissue factor and that promotes blood clot formation in blood vessels. While in infection, bacteria grow in these clots, forming a septic emboli which can get lodged in vessels. The procoagulants can also trigger DIC in which the coagulation pathway is outweighing fibrinolysis, depleting the supply of platelets and clotting factors. Fibrin degradation products are released into the circulation and interfere with platelet aggregation and clot formation, making hemostasis even more difficult. A paradox arises. Thrombosis on the one hand and trouble forming new clots which leads to bleeding on the other hand. The septic emboli gets lodged in a small vessel in the adrenal gland. The blood pressure rises, which stretches the vessel walls and can lead to rupture. On top of that, the IC makes it hard to form clots. Blood pools in the adrenal gland leads to increased local blood pressure, shuts nearby blood vessels and leads to ischemia uh -oh. and necrosis. In this case, Waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome can lead to a so-called Edisonian crisis. Both adrenal glands stop producing hormones, especially aldosterone and cortisol, which is when left untreated, fatal. Typical clinical features could be fever, headache, neck stiffness, photophobia, nausea, vomiting, muscle aches and pain, particular rash mostly on trunk and legs and CV cases even purpura fulminance with extensive necrosis of the skin, signs of shock with hypotension, tachycardia, tachypnea and even loss of consciousness. Further symptoms could be DIC, respiratory insufficiency as a consequence of the pathogens crossing the blood-brain barrier and causing an inflammatory reaction in the brain which leads to cerebral edema with neuronal damage and finally to respiratory paralysis and even cardiac insufficiency and death as a result of toxic myocardial dysfunction. The Edisonian crisis also called adrenal crisis comprises hypotension and even shock impaired consciousness and coma, fever, vomiting and diarrhea, severe abdominal pain and others as signs and symptoms. As diagnostic tool an ultrasound can be used in which the adrenal hemorrhage appears solid and diffusely echogenic as well as a CT scan to identify the blood collection within the adrenal glands. Laboratory diagnostics could include a blood culture to identify the causative organism, the proof of adrenal insufficiency by low sodium levels, low glucose levels, low cortisol levels, as well as high potassium levels, and DIC could be diagnosed by low platelet count, high D-dimers, low fibrinogen, and high PT and PTT. 
The rapid adrenocorticotropic hormone ACTH test could be another diagnostic tool. Normally corticotropin releasing hormone CRH is released by the hypothalamus to stimulate ACTH release. But if it's given intravenously, it is possible to stimulate the adrenal gland to produce cortisol. If those levels are still insufficient or it's not produced at all, adrenal insufficiency is proven. Oh no! Therapy is always done as an intensive care treatment. For the adrenal insufficiency, glucocorticoids, for example hydrocortisone or prednisolone are given, as well as mineral corticoids like flutrocortisone and androgen as needed dehydroepiandrosterone. The infection is treated by first an empiric antibiotic treatment with vancomycin plus ceftriaxone and second a definitive antibiotic treatment for example in meningococcal infection with the third generation of cephalosporins like cefotaxime or ceftriaxone. Waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome is often fatal without and even fatal with treatment particularly if associated with meningococcal infection. That's why early identification and the immediate initiation of antibiotic therapy is so important if it's suspected. Shock can be treated with IV fluids, vasopressors, for example, noradrenaline, and supplemental oxygen. The IC can be treated with packed red blood cells, cryoprecipitates, fresh frozen plasma, and platelets. In cases of severe necrosis, amputation could be necessary. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video and you want to support me, please like and subscribe to my channel or follow me on social media. Till the next time.